Death in Space Part 2 – How to be an Interplanetary Traveler My name is Felix and I am your host for today's episode of What About It. Today's episode is part 2 of a double feature where we follow a SpaceX starman in his starship to see how he could safely reach Mars. What are SpaceX and NASA doing to keep their astronauts safe on interplanetary trips? In last Monday's episode we talked about all sorts of dangers in space. What are they and which ones are the most dangerous? And we came to the following conclusion. What are the dangerous aspects of interplanetary travel that we will concentrate on in today's episode? Vacuum, radiation, zero-g and micrometeorites. Today we will get technical. We will try to find solutions to these problems. What will happen when starhopper testing is done? When a Starship or Orion crew module travels to Mars with astronauts for the first time? We will explore what kinds of ideas have been thought of or maybe even tested to save our starmen from certain death. So let's dive right in. Houston, we have a problem. NASA, as all the major space agencies around the world, has always tried to keep risks as low as possible. In the early days, the biggest problem was not how to protect an astronaut in space. The difficulty was to get them up there safely in the first place. But luckily it didn't take them long to figure out how to build a rocket that doesn't explode. In today's space flight, a rocket launch poses little risk. Don't get me wrong, it's not as safe as getting into your car and driving to the supermarket. But the days of having to fear for your life during launch are gone. In fact, the retired space shuttle is the number one death trap when it comes down to statistics. Of the 18 astronauts officially known who gave their lives for science during space missions worldwide, 14 died in the two space shuttle incidents. That's roughly 78%. So we're influenced by these disasters in thinking that launches and re-entries are very dangerous. On launch, no one ever died on a traditional rocket. Much more ground personnel died from unmanned rocket explosions during or after a launch. That's the main reason why I didn't mention it as a possible cause for our starman to die. It's just unlikely. The problems for our starman start to appear when he reaches space. Danger in space is silent and mostly invisible. So let's look at solutions to our starman's problems. Vacuum or how to keep nothing out. If Starman is subjected to space's vacuum, he will die, as we've seen in last Monday's episode. So we will have to make sure to give him the proper protection. But what about it? What would that protection be and what are NASA and SpaceX working on to improve on that aspect? Right now there are two kinds of manned spacecrafts. One is the traditional crew module or starship and the other is the spacesuit, which technically is nothing else than a smaller and more flexible spacecraft. Both have life support and shielding and both are absolutely airtight. A starman won't be traveling to Mars in a spacesuit though, we'll ignore them for today's episode. On NASA's side, Starman will ride on an Orion crew module or a proposed interplanetary shuttle. As there is almost nothing known about the interplanetary shuttle, we'll keep the focus on the module. The Orion crew module is a tough piece of hardware. It closely resembles the appearance of the Apollo command module, but it is larger, heavier and equipped with advanced systems. Overall, the crew module will have a maximum diameter of 5.02 meters, standing 3.3 meters tall, with a launch mass around 8,900 kilograms, offering an internal volume of 19.56 cubic meters, 8.95 of which will be habitable volume that can be accessed by the crew. Orion is designed to be able to support a crew for 21 days of active crew time, plus 210 days in a quiescent mode which will require crews to be supported by space habitat modules for long duration flights to distant targets. The pressure vessel and structural elements of the Orion spacecraft are built of olive green aluminum lithium alloy. The same was used for the super lightweight external tank of the space shuttle, used for the majority of missions since 1998. The crew module's core structure, the pressure vessel, consists of several components. 
bulkheads, the crew module barrel, the forward cone and the crew module tunnel that would interface with a docked spacecraft. These components are joined by self-reacting friction stir welding, which produces superior bonds and allows for the joining of aluminum lithium alloys that cannot be welded using traditional techniques. Installed around the pressure vessel and its various external systems are composite backshell panels with titanium honeycomb cores that provide additional protection. The same goes for a potential trip on a SpaceX Starship. But as there is very little known about its pressure vessel for astronauts, we'll assume a similar technology will be used by Elon Musk and his team. Though it might be interesting to see if they come up with a different strategy as Starship will be quite the different spacecraft. Sounds like a vault, doesn't it? And that's exactly what it is. To keep the atmosphere in, the crew module will have to be absolutely airtight with no chance of holes or raptures appearing on the flight. This will hopefully protect Starman from the vacuum on his journey to Mars. Radiation or how to stay in the shade. The next big problem for Starman will be radiation. And as we found out in last Monday's episode, cosmic rays are the biggest problem here. But what can we do about them? On the ISS, the aluminum outer hull does a great job when it comes to radiation shielding. This is due to the fact that cosmic radiation, the dangerous heavy ions, are kept away from the station by the Earth magnetic field, which extends far beyond it. In interplanetary space, that won't be the case though. When cosmic rays hit aluminum, some of them are absorbed. In the process though, they produce something called secondary radiation. When these high energy particles hit the atoms inside the hull material, both the cosmic particles and the nuclei of the hull split up into several new particles. These particles then accelerate into all directions, including the inside of the spacecraft. This is known as secondary radiation. Elon Musk stated several times that SpaceX is considering implementing liquid shielding in the hull to prevent this from happening. Liquid oxygen used as propellant as well as water used for life support can partially be stored in the outer hull of the spacecraft surrounding the habitat. In a spent nuclear fuel pool, for example, water is used to shield the strong radiation coming from from the nuclear fuel rods. In fact, this technique is so effective that divers who occasionally dive into these pools to service them are safe from the radiation. For the kinds of radiation coming off spent nuclear fuel, every 7 centimeters of water cuts the amount of radiation in half. In fact, as long as you were underwater, you would be shielded from most of the normal background dose as well. You may actually receive a lower dose of radiation treading water in a spent fuel pool than walking around on the street. Also, a solar wind shelter for a starship was mentioned by Elon Musk that would be based on the same principle. Artificial magnetic fields have been investigated to shield spacecrafts on interplanetary travels as well, though these would take tremendous amounts of power. So at the moment, they are most likely not feasible. So there are ways to shield our Starman from cosmic rays. We just have to develop ways to implement them into our spacecrafts. Zero G or how to keep things moving. As mentioned in last Monday's episode, low gravity could be countered by lots and lots of exercise. So Starman would be a running man on the way to Mars. But would there in theory be other ways to protect us from low gravity? There most definitely would be. Have you ever watched Stanley Kubrick's 2001 with its majestic space station spinning slowly to the Blue Danube waltz? There are a few sci-fi movie scenes that made a bigger impact on its viewers. Or Passengers, where Katniss Everdeen fights the aliens. Or did I mix something up there? Also a really good take was The Martian with their Hermes spacecraft. A very realistic approach and a treat for every space enthusiast. Again, it's just a question of feasibility. From the earliest days of modern sci-fi movies on, there have been quite realistic concepts of artificial gravity. It actually is quite easy. Just spin the habitat. Not even constant force would need to be applied. Only spin it up once and it will keep on spinning almost without friction. The faster you spin it at the edge, the stronger our Starman is pulled outwards. As gravity is nothing else but a force applied into one direction, it does not make any difference if gravity is substituted with any other force pulling into one direction. In this case, it's centrifugal force. So Starman could walk normally in his starship and things would fall down as on Earth. One thing that could actually happen though is mostly ignored in sci-fi movies. Starmen tend to get dizzy when swirled around. 
So no windows would be a good idea to trick our minds into believing that we're standing still instead of constantly spinning. So if we're willing to build huge spacecrafts, even bigger than the SpaceX Starship, we would be able to solve this problem very well. For longer than Mars distances, this would definitely be something to consider, for the damage done by low gravity gets worse over time. Micrometeorites or how to duck and cover from a mini railgun. Micrometeorites are small particles of dust or tiny rocks traveling at high speeds relative to the spacecraft. And as mentioned in last Monday's episode, they can pose a real danger to our starman. But what about it? What can we do against this particular threat in interplanetary space? The real problem here is the energy transferred from the micrometeorite to the spacecraft. Either you build the spacecraft so tough that the energy needed to seriously damage it would be higher, or you go another way. You can make it flexible. Both ways have their advantages and disadvantages. Making it strong obviously makes it heavier, and as we all know, the last thing you want to make a spacecraft is heavier. Though to a certain extent, this is the way to go. In fact, all spacecrafts need to be robust in order to mitigate the risk of possible impacts, be it at launch or in space. The most prominent example for underestimating impact damage would be the Space Shuttle Columbia. It wasn't a micrometeorite that caused the disaster, it was thermal insulation foam from the shuttle's main tank, falling off and hitting the leading edge of a wing. Damaged heat tiles led to heat entering the wing structure and resulting in a total loss of the vehicle and all seven astronauts on board. When investigations were done on what could have caused the accident, everyone was surprised to see what kind of forces were inflicted on the spacecraft's structure when the foam impacted at the right speed. So in general, it's a good idea to strengthen the outer hull of a spacecraft so it can withstand impacts up to a certain amount of force. And we're doing this already. Though as said, the stronger the hull, the heavier it is. So would there be other ways of protecting our Starman in space? There are, and you probably wouldn't have guessed it. Exactly the opposite of hard can help as well. Bigelow Aerospace, already covered by What About It in another episode, is building inflatable habitats and modules for space. Test prototypes are already operational on the ISS. And do you know what's the safest place on ISS when a theoretical meteor shower hits the station? Not the tin cans. It's Bigelow's softshell module. But these modules have disadvantages too. If the structure is flexible, all the internal lines and connections have to be flexible to a certain point as well. But what about it? Why is Bigelow's space balloon safer than a solid module strengthened by aluminum and titanium? Bigelow's space modules work like a bulletproof vest. They're made of Kevlar composite material. The fibers inside of it redirect the energy outwards. So the energy from a possible impact is not inflicted on a small area, but a much larger one due to the material giving in. Bigelow's modules could easily be attached to a spacecraft and work as a habitat module where the crew spends most of their time on their journey through space. The conclusion. So what lessons did we learn? First of all, space is dangerous, and we should never underestimate that. We're not made for space travel, so we have to make a safe spacecraft to venture beyond LEO. But as we've seen, we have all sorts of ways to outsmart space, to make that trip for Starman as safe as possible. Would that be a spacecraft with water-shielded, rotating, inflatable habitats? It certainly could be. In the end, a starship must be built for the task ahead, though. It must be designed precisely for what it's supposed to do. For example, if it has inflatable habitats, it can't easily enter an atmosphere. We already know a fair bit about NASA's approach with the Artemis program, about Orion, SLS and Luna and Mars gateways. We've also talked about the pros and cons in a recent episode. And most likely on August 24th, we will find out about Elon's plans for the Starhopper, the orbital prototypes and SpaceX's visions of how not to die in space. So this wraps up today's episode of What About It? What is your idea of a perfect spacecraft to Mars? As always, tell me in the comments. Thank you for watching this episode of What About It? If you liked what you saw, don't forget to subscribe and like as this helps me the most. Feel free to hit me up on my Patreon page so I can get additional help in doing more and better content as this gives me the time to focus on what I love doing the most. To bring you the latest and greatest about space and science. I hope to see you on the next episode. Until then, have a great time. Why is Bigelow's spa- Flieger. But what about it?
tremendous amounts of power. Ha <laughs> ha. Tremendous amounts. As the damage done by lack of gravity gets worse over time. Why is Bigelow's space saloon 